Hey everyone, welcome to uh, another week where we are continuing our discussion of the book of Revelation. Um, we had a, a few questions come our way and we're going to try and address both of them, but at least get started with the first one of looking at, as you discussed, the kind of four views of reading Revelation. Now that's kind of, there's more views than that, but these are like the four dominant ones. Sure. And it also needs to be stated that within these four dominant views are very different ways of viewing it within these where like some right. people view stuff more symbolically and some more literally and there's all kinds of things but there's really these four main views that you talked about sunday and just if you could go into a little bit more detail about what those views are and yeah yeah so we're looking at uh, really revelation chapter five up through chapter 19 um which is all kinds of great stuff you know, we get the seven uh, seals, which then unfolds to the seven trumpets, which unfolds to the seven bowls of wrath. And within it, you've got interludes and visions. Um, so it's a lot, um, though there's the structure. And so, yeah, I mentioned these four views, and uh, some people asked me uh, to elaborate a little bit more to explain it. Um, so the four views uh, include what's called preterist. Um, so someone asked me, like, can you even spell that? Uh, yes, it's P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T. So <laughs> it refers to the past. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I came across this when I was first doing Matthew and reading Matthew 23 and talked about Jesus' uh, vision of the future in Jerusalem. And I was reading and coming across what was called a preterist view. And this also applies to uh, the book of Re Revelation, which really just sees the events talked about in Revelation as referring to things that unfolded either around the fall of Jerusalem or the fall of Rome itself, which undoubtedly is that's a long period of time. But nonetheless, um, this is kind of governed by the fact, okay, that the readers of the original readers of the book of Revelation, this would have been the what's in their heart, what's in their mind, and that these visions and these symbols and these things mentioned were uh, representative of what was going on around them and really not uh, a future component to it. So that's called uh, the preterist view. Uh, the second view is called the historist view. Uh, and so basically uh, these are things that have been fulfilled in the course of Western history, uh, Europe, Rome, America. Uh, and so they'll look at Napoleon or they'll look at um, the Pope as potential Antichrist. Um, and so it has um, really a backwards look. Um, when Israel became a nation, um, this really kind of rose in popularity. Um, but the problem with that is well, how would the original readers understood that understanding, that perspective? And it would have been nonsensical to them. It also, like, it brings in these questions of, like, are these the moments? Like, I remember I was reading through some of it and it was talking about, okay, the first four bowls of, or trumpets are all referring to these moments of, within the history of attacks against the Roman Empire, the Byzantium, Byzantine Empire, and um, yeah. until leading up in, like, the, the fifth trumpet or sixth trumpet is talking about the fall of Constantinople, and then, mm -hmm. like, the, the little book is the... Um, the printing press and the availability of scripture going out to the world, which, you know, it's good theory, but like, we don't know this right. to be true. We don't know, like, why is it just Western history? Like, is that what God had in mind? But there's, you know. Yeah. If I was a Chinese believer, I might be a little right miffed about that. <laughs> yeah. And so that's one of the issues that kind of pops into mind if, with discussing that and like, been, well, how do you know? Like, it's interesting yeah. to look at history and the scope of it and go, maybe these are the things happening, mm -hmm. but it, it just seems very, uh, shot in the darky yeah <laughs> like we think it's this <laughs> it's definitely speculative yeah um and that's one of the problems with a lot of these views is that it's a lot more speculation than really just was the text say um and and just to add a little wrinkle into all that um you know when we study the old testament prophecies we often bring up that there's a near and a far fulfillment mm -hmm. um what if that's the case as well with the apocalyptic prophecies that there could be a near and a far fulfillment, that maybe there was something going on in the Roman Empire with the fall of Constantinople and other things that could have been alluded to as well as, you know, 2,000 years later. So that's another wrinkle to add into all of right. all that to complicate that. So, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that. But <laughs> there we go. Uh, but I think the question still is how do the original 
peers, would they have understood any of this? And I think that does need to play a, a role in that dynamic of mm -hmm. what do we go with this? And if it is more speculation than just what does the text say, then you, you probably need to hold it less firm right. in, in our convictions. Uh, the third view is the futurist view. Um, so all these events from chapter four, really all through 22, are all largely unfulfilled. Um, so still are yet to be, like it hasn't happened now. And all these things are looking in front of us. And so again, the question is, well, how would the original hearers understood that? And um, I think obviously the, the book of Revelation speaks at the time that these are things to come um, near and far. And so the book of Revelation admits there is a future component. Uh, uh, the argument of the future view as well, it is, and it has none of these things have happened yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a, a forward look. And I think there's certainly some elements in it because of the text says that there's some elements in that. And then there is uh, aptly called the idealist perspective. Um, obviously the one who kind of brought up these four views probably was going with this one uh, and calling it the idealist and so uh, basically what they're saying is that these events of chapter 5 through really 19 but also the other ones are largely symbolic and will be fulfilled symbolically through the history of the church uh, and between the battles of sin and evil with God and that you see elements of it in every age and so leaning on that near and far fulfillment like okay these are being fulfilled in our current day but there's still a further fulfillment that mm -hmm. uh and so we can see these and, and you get that with first john uh, as he talks about the antichrist you know we, we're, we're coming across this or we will come across this the antichrist figure as we read next week uh and john looks at it and says there are many antichrists and the spirit of antichrist is among us um, paul says the spirit of lawlessness is among us so there, you definitely get that there's elements in every age, mm -hmm. but it seems to suggest that there's going to be a final, uh, a final element of this. And so the idea of the looking at this largely symbolically, um, it it seems to avoid some of the speculation, but at the same time it downplays some literal um, elements that uh, as you read interpretation, one of the things that we're taught is you go with the clear most literal understanding first. Um, if it's an obscure text, then you like figure out what's the clear reading, the natural reading of this, unless you've got hints to go otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so the problem with the symbolic is that it kind of works against that rule of interpretation, yet it fits in with the genre <laughs> right. of apocalyptic. <laughs> so uh, there's that exception. And so part of what the problem is, you got a couple of rules of interpretation that collide right. with uh, something like the book of Revelation. Um, so, um, I, I kind of lean personally toward the futurist and idealist. Mm -hmm. I, I, here's, here's the great thing. You don't have to stay in one camp. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, uh, because uh, no one says you have to. Mm -hmm. um, these are just four typical ways of looking at it. And I think, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with having both of a futuristic with idealistic to say, yeah, there are symbols because this is apocalyptic, but there's also some real things that's being talked about mm -hmm. that we shouldn't so underestimate that within that it kind of it then brings up the question of like how do we approach this with reading do we should we as because we don't want to it's really tempting to just go i don't get it i'm just not going to deal with revelation i'm just not going to read it um but if that's it's scripture it's sure. the word of god we need to deal with it so is the best way to go about it is to kind of study these different views and kind of try and like understand it all or is it better just kind of like pick one and study that or what, yeah. what would kind of be your recommended so approach? it depends <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much time you have right okay um and it probably may depend on where you are in your faith mm -hmm. um but if you don't have a lot of time um you know for most folks you go in the day to day and you're working and you got you got demands on you um and you won't you want me to figure it out <laughs> <laughs> um so in that case, I think that what you should do, and I think the first reading anyway, should always be what's the universal timeless truth that's taught mm -hmm. in this. When you get past the symbols, uh, because because they're there. And one of the things that's great about Revelation is it doesn't just leave you in the symbols. There are usually some explanation verses around it uh, where it talks about what this means for the hearer. Um, 
And so those are very directly stated, some timeless truths. You look to that, you think about that, you hold on to that, you let that direct you in how you live your life and how you plan your future and, and think about the end times is remembering these timeless truths. If you have more time and you've got a desire to do it, then I would say, yeah, explore and try to, to grapple with what the symbols are saying. But all the while, I think one of the dangers is, is all the while letting those timeless universal truths reign in our thinking. The, the, the trick is that when we get down these roads of what this could mean, what that could mean, and we go down a speculative road, it starts to dominate. Um, and that's not the point of the book of Revelation. So if you do have the time um, and you want to do it, I, my caution is do it, but don't forget the main messages of the book. And don't let the speculation overshadow uh, the message of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, yeah, it, I would encourage it if you've got the time, as long as you keep the focus on. I mean, Revelation says, blessed it's the only book that says, blessed are the ones who read this word, uh, read it aloud, and hear it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's one of the only New Testament books that says, man, if you read it, you'll be blessed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm going to agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, do you want to tackle the question about when is the rapture coming now, or should we save that for next week? Yeah, I guess maybe we should save it for next week. <laughs> Sounds good. The questions are coming. Right. Um, you know... Because cause really what everyone wants to know, mm -hmm. they don't really care about the preterists or historians of futures. So like, right. when is the Lord coming back? Do I have to sit through all this? Do I have to, can I avoid this? That's really the question right. everyone wants to know. Yeah, so is there, what does this rapture of the church look like? Yes. When does it occur? So the good news is like there that? is ra a rapture. There is a rapture. Yeah. But what does that look like? <laughs> anyway. When does it unfold? All that stuff are... Uh, there's a lot of different views on it, and right. it all fits in. All of this stuff starts tying together, and we'll continue to talk about these different topics. So if you have any other questions, send them my way or Pastor Jared's way. Um, we will continue to study and research and um, talk about it throughout the week, and Jared will. Um, it's kind of it's unfortunate that it worked out where our guest speaker won't be able to speak this week, but it just gives <laughs> Pastor Jared another week to spend. Yeah, I know. We were uh, just going to go without that this week but i guess the lord just changed that so yes here we go yep so thank you for listening and watching and uh, we hope you have a blessed week mm -hmm.